And I'm now going to introduce Dr. Uh, Louis Wiener, who is the head of the Lombardi Cancer Center, has been since 2008. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I, I titled this A View from the Trenches, and uh, I really am in the trenches. I run the Lombardi Cancer Center here at Georgetown University, but I also see patients. And uh, yesterday evening at around 6 o'clock, I had to go up into the hospital to talk to one of my absolutely favorite patients of all time to put him on hospice because his pancreatic cancer has uh, worsened and despite everything, you know, this man who's in his early 50s, you know, has to be placed on hospice. So uh, I live the struggle every day as a doctor uh, trying to do my best for my patients. And uh, what I hope to do with you today is to just frame this conversation. There's some very important issues that we'll be talking about at this conference. But we can't forget, I think, what the stakes are and what we're trying to accomplish, and that's what I hope to share with you today. So the first thing I want to talk about is what I know about, which is cancer. And uh, there is good news on this front. In, uh, in 1970, uh, when the National Cancer Act was, 1971, when the National Cancer Act was passed, roughly, um, uh, I would say it was roughly one out of three people diagnosed with cancer could expect to be cured uh, of their cancer by what was then contemporary therapy. Now it's about one out of two can be expected to, expect to be cured. The number of people dying from cancer has dropped dramatically. These graphs show that this is true both in men and women. And you can see that in males there's been a particularly striking uh, drop from a very large peak over the last few years. And I think what's important about this is this is not fudge data. This isn't because we're detecting more cancers as we used to and we sort of you know, spike the numbers up. This is how many folks are dying and whose death certificates state that they had cancer. So these are real numbers. Now, the question is, why is this happening? And it's, there's a variety of reasons why. First, uh, and perhaps most importantly, are behavioral changes in our society. Uh, we don't smoke as much as we used to. Fewer people smoke, and they smoke less. And that has certainly led to less lung cancer. And if you go back to this prior slide here, what you can see is in the males, uh, a good proportion of that reduction in mortality is probably based upon the reduction in lung cancer and deaths, and that's good. Thing. Also, there is early detection. Uh, mammography for all the controversies associated with when you should start it, when you should do it, how frequently you should do it, clearly has become very highly penetrant in our society among women who are at greatest risk of developing breast cancer. And it's quite clear there's been early, uh, earlier detection. And it's been estimated, although I think the data are still going to need some more time to, to ripen, that roughly half of the reductions in breast cancer mortality that we've seen in the last 20 years can be attributed to earlier and better diagnosis and more appropriate early therapy. Now, but the important thing is that there's also been better therapy. There were more cures of common cancers due to uh, the use of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, which is the kind of treatments we give following surgery that was intended to be curative, but isn't always curative. And uh, I'll give you some examples of that uh, shortly. And people who have cancers that are no longer curable are able to live longer because there are more effective therapies and more effective management of their symptoms uh, than they used to be. So in general, there, it's a multifactorial um, reason as to why people are better. So now, I do not know why this happened. Uh, it didn't look like this on my map. Um, but uh, what this is supposed to show you is a study that goes back to 1989 where individuals who had colon cancer that was judged to be high risk at the time of surgery, meaning that the, the tumors had uh, spread to uh, the regional lymph nodes around the area of the colon resection, were randomly assigned to either receive no therapy, which was the standard of care at that time, or two different forms of chemotherapy. And what they found was that uh, when they, uh, it was that the folks who received the chemotherapy had a roughly 25% reduction in mortality compared to those who did not. And that's a major impact, impact because in this group of patients, which is roughly 50,000 people a year in the United States at that time, that's a lot of lives saved. And you have to remember that while we have to always look at the larger impact of and the economic toxicity of our treatments, in a sense, to the society, that you know, my job as a doctor is to save my patients' life if I can. And so we are, and, and there are a lot of people who I've treated over the years with adjuvant chemotherapy for colon cancer, which is one of my specialties, 
who are alive and well and got to you know, you know, see their grandchildren get born because uh, of the treatments that they were given. And that's a good thing. Um, so this is not going to work out well at all. I don't know what's going on here. But uh, this, uh, there's something funny about the way this, uh, this is working. Didn't look like this at all on my slides. So at any rate, uh, the other, uh, what I was going to show you here, and unfortunately you're not going to be able to see the curves are, is that in 1989-1990, it was reported that roughly 50% uh, of women who had um, a breast cancer that was lymph node positive, meaning they had a high risk of relapse, had about a 50% chance of being cured uh, of, their, of their cancer if they contained no known genetic abnormalities. But if their cancers uh, had an amplification of a particular gene called her genome, those patients were destined to have a much poorer outcome. And that was um, uh, something which we had finally recognized, beginning this new era of molecularly targeted therapy. And 21 years later, this study, which actually is showing up on the screen, uh, comes out. And it's a very powerful study, because I want you to take a look over here at um, at these curves. Well, on the far right, on the upper right, where it says A, what you can see is, for, if you look at the blue curve up there, the women who got chemotherapy, which would be standard of care, plus an antibody that, that targets the particular protein that's encoded by that amplified gene, have a, dr a tremendous event-free survival, nearly, nearly 100% as opposed to the women who did not receive that additional drug, Herceptin, which is used to treat patients with uh, HER2-positive malignancies. And if you look on the bottom at the proportion of women who are alive, it's stunning. Now remember that, and well, you can't see it, that this same group of women with the same molecular characteristics only 21 years earlier had a roughly 50% chance of dying of their cancer. So in only 20 years, this molecularly classified group of breast cancer patients, which comprises roughly a quarter of all women who develop breast cancer, have gone from having a 50-50 chance of being alive in, in, in the five or 10 years to basically having a nearly 100% chance of being alive. Okay? Now, the treatments are toxic. The treatments you know, don't make people happy, but the treatments work. And this is an important thing to remember in my mind. And better therapies do prolong lives. I deliberately, because I know it was this conference, downloaded a, a, um, a, 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 a figure from the Genentech website. Genentech is the company that makes this happen. But I think the point here is, again, if you just look at these curves here, that yellow curve on the bottom is the group of people who do not receive Herceptin and happen to have the molecular abnormality, even if their cancers had spread and were no longer curable. The top lines were those folks who had received Herceptin and they, their, their survival was as good as if they didn't have the molecular abnormality. And the point is that these curves, again, don't mean much, but you're talking about six months uh, average prolongation of life just from the use of this one treatment. And again, from a pharmacoeconomic perspective, we can have a debate about whether that's worth it. But for, for me, speaking as a physician, taking care of a patient, giving a person an additional six months of good quality living, which is what we're able to do, has a very important impact. There's a lot of birthdays to be going to in six months. There's a lot of happy events. There's a lot of opportunities to see a child or a grandchild graduate from, from high school or college. And really, that's what we're here to do, is to help our patients on an individual per patient basis. So, oh, uh, again, I'm so sorry, folks. I don't understand how this happened. This is a very powerful slide in my mind, because it's not all, um, not all roses. There's another drug that was approved recently, which is actually a pretty good drug and is used in a variety of different um, settings, called erlotinib, which is an, a, a small molecule that blocks signaling through a specific receptor that's involved in cancer, known as the epidermal growth factor receptor. And the basis for the approval of erlotinib as an anti-cancer drug was based on a randomized controlled clinical trial in which patients with advanced metastatic pancreatic cancer, the same disease that, I, that forced me to put my patient on hospice uh, that I described at the beginning of my presentation. They were randomly assigned to receive treatment with either gemcitabine, a standard chemotherapy drug that's widely used to treat this disease, or gemcitabine plus or lightning. Now, 
The natural history of metastatic pancreatic cancer is that the median survival is 100 days without um, any additional, without any therapy. If you give gemcitabine, you double that median survival to roughly six months. Again, not much, but certainly many people would agree that an additional three months of, of, of life, if it's a decent quality, is something that they would opt for given the option. The addition of relaxant to um, uh, uh, gemcitabine prolonged the median survival by a grand total of 11 days. 11 days, at the expense of rash and other symptoms that uh, fatigue and great economic cost. So the question becomes, okay, you can get a statistically significant improvement in outcome, and that's the way the system is sort of rigged these days, to actually try and get that significant improvement. But did it really matter? Is that really enough to warrant the use of this drug in combination with the added toxicity, the added cost, et cetera? And many oncologists, I might add, have voted with their feet and generally do not use a lot of in combination with gemcitabine for that reason. Because uh, we'll talk in a bit about the difference between, you know, efficacy and effectiveness. And I think that a lot of doesn't cross that effectiveness now. So, I think that what, I, what I'm hoping you'll, you'll agree with me is that new cancer drugs have saved lives. And they've done a wonderful job of saving lives in many cases. So who makes these drugs? Well, the answer is that virtually all these drugs come out of farming. Uh, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, uh, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, has been a very helpful partner in this effort with pharma and with the academic world. But it really has very limited resources and does not have the scale or the capacity to really develop new drugs that are potentially life-saving. It can be a, an effective partner for leveraging some new discoveries, but no more than that. And we folks in academia think we're really smart. But, uh, and we are, some of us. Um, but uh, I must tell you that we're really lousy when it comes to making new drugs. Um, there's the, the level of rigor, the scale, the scope, the, um, the attention to pharmaceutical detail that's required to make new drugs is something well beyond the capacity of a typical university or cancer center. Um, so I think that one of the things that I've come to the conclusion of is that we have to find ways to make effective partnerships with pharma in order to make products. Absolutely necessary. Now, how do we evaluate the benefits of these drugs? And I, I talked about this a little bit with the um, issue of efficacy versus effectiveness. Um, efficacy means that you've improved survival by 11 days. You can prove it statistically, it's significant. Um, there's no question about it. The methodology is pristine and that, and, and, and depending on how you, you, you know, to make a study large enough, you can detect a very small difference in the outcome, right? But, that it didn't matter. And I think that what we're beginning to think about in this era of cost-effectiveness is whether it matters, whether the improvements we get make a difference. And the decisions about what is truly effective is perhaps beyond the purview of the physician who's in the trenches, that's seeing the patient taking care of the patient. Somebody one day, you know, if you live in Great Britain, you might say, well, a three-month survival advantage just isn't simply enough. We can't afford that three-month survival advantage. We in America have not been willing to have that conversation, generally speaking. And most of our patients say, if you can give me an extra 30 seconds of life with this high quality, I'm in, I'm in for it. That's the way it works. And uh, we have a, a, a lot of attitude adjustments that will have to be undertaken if we're going to change that, that philosophy that patients bring to the doctor's office when they're seeing and taking care of. So, now that we know that new cancer drugs have saved lives, how do we make it less costly to develop new drugs for terrible diseases like cancer? One of the challenges we have is it's very, very expensive to make new drugs. It's estimated that it costs $1 billion to get a single drug approved. And the problem, of course, is that this is a, a tricky business. And most drugs that are taken into drug development don't work. So part of that cost is the drugs that don't work. But another part of the cost is the extraordinarily high bars that have been set by regulatory agencies for drug approval, which have driven some of the behaviors that we see. For example, uh, for my patient with pancreatic cancer, if I had, had access to a drug that would be commercially available in some limited manner, which hadn't yet jumped through every possible hoop, which, but which showed early preliminary progress, but not every toxicity ribbon had been tied up perfectly, my patient would have been willing to take that. Would it, now, if he had been a healthy guy and this was an anti-allergy drug, you know, that would be inappropriate because the risk-benefit ratios would not be appropriate. So we have to have that conversation in a more open way in this country, I think. 
Um, and how do we limit the unnecessary and potentially harmful use of cancer drugs? And you know, I think that this is an issue in that most of the people I know who make mistakes with prescribing drugs aren't doing so because they were you know, uh, conned into it by, by some evil pharmaceutical company, rep, drug rep, rep or something like that. It's, you know, you're trying to help a person and you're trying to use what you can and sometimes we let our hearts get in the way of our heads and we make bad decisions with good intentions. And we have to rely upon better use of modern tools for evidence-based medicine. I talked a little bit about the philosophical change in approach, you know, an example going back to pancreatic cancer. If somebody has received a, a drug regimen for the treatment of pancreatic cancer and it hasn't worked, and they now have refractory disease, um, do we just go to the pharma, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the, drugstore that in our, in our hospitals and pick out something else and try something we know isn't likely to work? Or do we say to our patient, we don't have anything that'll work, let's, let's concentrate on your comfort, or let's think if we can't find a clinical trial to test some new concept that might be helpful to you. And that's an area that I think we have to do a much better job. And, you know, I think that uh, the last point here, excuse me, uh, Regulation uh, is going to be necessary for this by third party payers and by government. But how we do that with, and not throw the baby out with the bathwater is something that I'm very concerned about. We still have to have some flexibility to do what's best for our patients given our patients' unique characteristics and properties. So, uh, and I think this is my final slide. Um, how do we manage the inevitable tensions between marketing forces? drug discovery, drug development, to facilitate progress and improve health for the public. Um, again, much of the off-label use that I see being used in the cancer world, at least, is rooted in sound biological principles, published data, and a hope on the parts of the practitioners that what they're going to do is going to be helpful for their patients. The challenge that we face, in my mind, is how we can separate this from what might be considered deceptive marketing practices, conservative regulatory environment, in order to do what's best for, the, for the, our individual patients and for the public health. And with that, I'll be happy to stop. And at this time, I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm Alan Schwartz from the New York Times. Right. Um, just because it just jumped out at me, and no one else has the guts to ask a question, uh, the published data uh, on which mm -hmm. these drugs are used in my experience, and it's limited, there's a lot of published data out there that holds as much water as your average colander. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, I mean, there's a study coming out today about nothing that anyone here would be particularly interested in, but I know about, that's utter garbage. And anyone who knows anything about the subject, and it's in a reputable journal, mm -hmm. is utter garbage. Mm -hmm. How much scrutiny is placed on published data? Or is it just accepted because it's published data? Well, that's a good question. Now, I think that uh, there's still a need for there to be judgment, right? The, the, the practitioner and the pharmacy committees in a hospital that might be agreeing or not agreeing to uh, allow a particular regimen to be used are charged with interpreting the meaning of the data. I mean, there are, if something has been published in the journal with irreproducible results as a single-arm study with four people, I mean, uh, presumably, you know, we have to ex expect that some of the training of a physician is going to involve the ability to interpret whether that is meaningful or not meaningful. I'm talking about reputable journals without obvious holes. So there are going to be circumstances. I mean, it's, a, it's an important question. I mean, you know, uh, it's data or data, right? I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, if somebody, if something is published in the New England Journal of Medicine or you know, or Journal of American Medical Association, and it demonstrates that that through treatment A is promising, uh, we are in the field not without our ability to judge the quality of the paper. But those papers have gone through a fairly rigorous peer review system, as you well know. 
And I guess all I can say is that occasionally mistakes are likely to be made based upon everyone's best interpretation of the data and best intentions. I mean, the, the history of medicine is filled with decisions to go in a certain direction with therapies based upon a body of evidence. And then new evidence comes out or it becomes clear that that evidence was inaccurate and we act and have to change course. I, I don't think you can ever completely protect the public against those kinds of well-intentioned mistakes. I don't, I, you know, all you can do is do that. You're assuming they're well-intentioned. Yes. Well, the well-intentioned mistakes. About sloppiness. Or about sloppy, illogical. Well, so I was not talking, when I said well-intentioned mistakes, the well-intentioned mistakes I'm talking about is that I'm trying to come up with a treatment program for a patient. And a paper's been published in a good journal, and I read it, and I don't see a hole in it. And I later learned that the authors and the journal made a mistake. I mean, that's kind of like me deciding to buy a, a new car uh, that looked and had wonderful reviews and consumer reports. But it turns out that the, you know, there's a flaw in the engine that I didn't know about because I'm not an expert in, 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 in engines. And I have, it gets recalled. I mean, th things like that are going to happen, I'm afraid. All we can ever do is our best. And, do our, and we can't, we can't, the, the thing I worry about is that if we take the attitude that mistakes are being made and that there's sloppiness in published papers, which I, I, I accept as a, as a, as, a, as a fact that it, it certainly occurs. The consequence is that then we should say, well, we're not going to ever do anything because we have to be completely skeptical and therefore we can take no action. And I personally believe that while there are problems, the progress in my field indicates that with all the problems, that the mortality rates from, from cancer have dropped significantly in the last 20, 25 years. And that drop in mortality is not simply due to the fact that people stop smoking or started getting mammograms. It's because there are better treatments out there. So somehow, despite the, the, the bumps in the road, and there are serious and important bumps in the road, we make progress. And I would hate to see us throw that away just because there are improprieties and mistakes being made. We have to find that balance somehow. <coughs> Uh, Dennis is the Associate Medical Director for Utilization and Case Management here in Georgetown. Uh, he is also a pediatrician, which makes him particularly qualified for that job because most of the people with whom he deals act like children. Um, so Dennis, why don't you come on up here? Um, I was, our, our next speaker then is Dr. Joel Lutzchen, who has been a visitor here at this conference for several years in a row. We welcome him back, and certainly we welcome all of you back who are returning people and folks who are here new. Uh, welcome to Georgetown. Dr. Lutzchen received his MD degree from the University of Toronto in 1977, and for 24 years since then has been an emergency me, room physician at the University Health Network in New York. He is currently a professor of the School of Health Policy and Management at York University. He has been a consultant on pharmaceutical issues for the province of Ontario, various arms of the Canadian federal government, the World Health Organization, the government of New Zealand, and the Australian National Prescribing Service. He's the author or co-author of over 115 peer-reviewed articles on topics such as physician prescribing behavior, pharmaceutical patent issues, the drug approval process, and prescription drug promotion. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. Being I am of the age to remember Mad Magazine, in fact, that's where the title of this does come from. Um, but before I start, uh, let me just say I have no conflicts to declare um, that are relevant for this um, talk. So, yes, that is Alfred E. Newman, the poster boy for Mad Magazine. And the object of this talk is to see whether or not clinicians, um, of which I am one, take the same attitude towards practicing as Alfred might take. So do we worry about what we're doing? What's our responsibility? And I think these, at least, are some of the things that a responsible clinician should be doing. So maintaining an adequate level of knowledge, knowing what's on and off label, 
accessing information from appropriate sources, being aware of how we can be influenced, avoiding conflict of interest situations, and choosing the correct medicine. And the rest of this talk is going to look at these issues with a variety of data from Canada and the United States. So the first question is um, maintaining an adequate level of knowledge. And the question here is, how many drugs do we actually need to know about? And the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is not very many at all. So this is some data from Canada. The average Canadian general practitioner, now you guys don't have very many general practitioners, but in Canada, 50% of all the doctors are general practitioners. 50% of all the prescriptions that a GP writes are based on about 30 drugs, not the same 30 in each practice, but that's the average number. So you really don't need to know about all the gazillions of drugs that are out there on the market if you're going to do general practice and see the wide variety of patients that a general practitioner would see. And just a little bit more information about how many drugs do you need. So this is an older comparison. This is Norway, when Norway used to have what was called a medical needs clause in their drug approval process. In other words, if the company couldn't demonstrate there was a, that there was an actual need for a product, they wouldn't approve it. So at that point in time, Norway had seven NSAIDs on the market. The Netherlands had 22 NSAIDs on the market, and the rheumatologists in Norway were pretty happy with the selection that they had. They didn't think they needed an extra 15 medications. Again, on this issue around how many drugs do we need to know about, this is some data that I've just generated from Canada. In this 15-year period, we approved 336 new active substances the, um, the term in the U.S. is new molecular entities. Um, and out of those 336, if you looked at objective sources of information, under 10% were significant therapeutic improvements. So that's about two a year. And even if those two a year were going to be used by a wide variety of doctors, that's not a lot of products to, um, to learn about. The question of on and off label, there are a lot of prescriptions that are written off label. So in Canada, in adults, a recent paper said about one in 10 products are off label. In the United States, when they included children, um, in looking at this issue, it was about one in five which are off label. And interestingly, most of the time, more than three quarters of the time, when things are off label, there's no good scientific evidence for them, or for the indications. And if you ask doctors if they know what's on or off label, this slide has a lot of information, but the takeaway message here is that by and large, even if you use a drug frequently, you don't know a lot of the time what's on or off label. So people are writing off label prescriptions, they don't know whether it's on or off label, and most of the time that they're writing these prescriptions, um, there's no good scientific evidence to back them up. In terms of getting adequate, getting appropriate information, doctors in both Canada and the United States see sales reps quite frequently. These are the people who the companies pay to go door to door, office to office, um, talking to doctors about their products. And most of the time, doctors say that they're seeing these people to get information from them. So what kind of information are they actually getting? We, a colleague of mine, Barbara Mincy's, um, from the University of British Columbia and I, undertook a study where we had general practitioners in Toulouse, France, Montreal, Vancouver, and Sacramento fill out survey forms after they had seen sales reps to look at the quality of safety information that the sales reps were giving to these doctors. So first of all, did, they sell, did the sales reps mention benefits and did they mention harms? And you can see from this slide that overwhelmingly in all four sites 
they were much more likely to mention benefits than harms. And this gets, although they did sometimes mention harms, how much safety information did the doctors actually get? And the answer is pretty minimal. So here we have three, four different kinds of safety information um, that we thought the doctors should be getting. So non-serious adverse events, contraindications, serious adverse events, and drug interactions. And you can see there that even for non-serious adverse events, only about, at best, and this is in France, one in three interactions transmitted that kind of information. When you get down to drug interactions, you're getting into one or two percent of the time. So doctors, when they see the sales reps, may be learning about the benefits of the drugs. They're certainly not learning about the harms associated with them. Despite this, if you ask the doctors who took part, what they thought about the quality of the scientific information that they were given. Most of them thought that, or the majority thought that it was good or excellent. So doctors, despite not getting very much information, still think that, they're, um, that the sales reps are doing a good job. And they're more likely to start prescribing the drug after listening to this non-information. When you look at the effects of sales reps on prescribing, and we did this recently in a systematic review of studies that looked at the effects of getting information from drug companies and how did that affect prescribing. If you just take the part of the sales reps, you can see here that it doesn't matter what you're looking at, in terms of prescribing behavior, so frequency of prescribing, quality of prescribing, or cost of prescribing, either these things got worse or there was no effect. They never got better by seeing a sales rep. Unfortunately, doctors don't realize that they can be influenced by this kind of information. So here we have the same question being asked of two different of doctors about two different groups. So first of all, themselves. Can you be influenced by your interaction with the sales rep? And the individual doctors, 1% said that they thought they could be influenced. The vast majority said not at all. But if you ask them whether or not they trusted the doctor sitting beside them, the answer wasn't quite the same. In that case, 51% said, yeah, you know, my colleague's eyes are a little shifty. <laughs> she might be influenced 51% of the time. So doctors, in my view at least, are pretty naive about their ability to resist being influenced. And that goes for um, other things, so company-sponsored CME, People re recognize that the CME may be biased if it's sponsored by a drug company, but again, they don't think that they're going to be influenced by it. And this is just another example of this. So this is a, an older paper. This is, was done, the study was done in the Boston area in the early 1980s. It asked doctors where they went for their sources of information. And if you look at this, it looks pretty good that doctors said that they didn't use um, the drug ads, they didn't use the detailers, what they used were the, was the scientific information. But then if you ask them about two particular kinds of drugs, the answer, the, what you see isn't quite as reassuring. So they asked them about, first, the, um, a group of drugs that used to be called the cerebral vasodilators. This was based on the theory that one of the causes of dementia was hardening of the arteries, not getting enough blood flow to the brain, and if you dilated up the arteries, you could relieve some of the symptoms of dementia. By the time that the people who did this study, that theory was pretty well been thrown out. The only place you could see it was in the drug literature. 
But in spite of that, in spite of the fact that there was no basis for it, 71% of the clinicians, the ones who said that they went to the scientific literature for their information, 71% thought that impaired blood, cerebral blood flow was a major cause of dementia, and a third of them thought that this group of drugs, um, cerebral vasodilators, was actually useful. <clears throat> if you look at the responses to um, how, how good they thought dextropropoxaphene or Darvon was, Darvon was a pretty lousy drug, unsafe, not very effective, but in spite of that, most of them still had a positive opinion about Darvon. Putting put in a conflict of interest situation. So this looks at the prescribing of an antibiotic at various times in its history in a particular hospital. So we start off, time one, drug is added to the hospital formulary, and there aren't very many prescriptions being written for it. Goes along to time two, company invites a group of doctors to an all expense paid vacation to learn about the drug in somewhere warm. Doctors are at the, um, after the doctors get the invitation, time three, they're, they've gone away to the conference, prescribing falls a bit, they come back from the conference though, and the prescribing shoots up and stays up. This is in spite of the fact that these doctors were asked, do you think that going to this all expense paid conference is going to affect your prescribing? And most of the doctors who answered that said no. And this just shows you that, um, oops, that the prescribing at this hospital where the doctors got to go on vacation was far in excess of the prescribing at other similar sites. Medical students um, have a particular, will, are quite willing to accept gifts. They don't seem to recognize that the gifts that they're going to get whatever they are, always come with an obligation to reciprocate. And if you doubt that, think about Christmas cards. If you get a Christmas card this year from somebody that you didn't think was worthwhile sending one to, what are you going to do the following year? The person still isn't very worthwhile, but you're probably going to send one because you've gotten a gift from them and you now feel that you need to reciprocate. And this is the situation when it comes to gifts to medical students from pharma. If you look at CME, this is just a, even if we accept that there is no bias in the CME that companies sponsor, and I'll come to that in a minute, company sponsored CME is still going to narrow what we learn. It's going to be in the, it's going to be more focused on drug therapy. It's going to be, um, have a fewer range of topics. So this slide looks at two sets of courses, one sponsored by Harvard, where people pay to go in to the course, and another one sponsored by drug companies, where you got in for free because the companies were paying all the cost. And you can see the difference both in the number of topics and in how frequently drug therapy was the focus. And if you believe this slide, there actually is a bias in company-sponsored CME. This looked at two different courses talking about antihypertensives and which drugs should be the first line choice for people with um, newly diagnosed hypertension. So course number one was sponsored by the makers of nifedipine, and despite the fact that course, both courses were supposed to be run on the basis of a, um, a, 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 an educational grant, in other words, where the company didn't have any input into the course, somehow at the end of course one, the only drug that went up in prescribing was nifedipine, and for course two, the makers were um, diltiazem, and the only drug that went up 
after course two in terms of prescribing was diltiazem. So even though these, the money to run these programs was supposed to be free of any obligations to the company, that didn't seem to be the case when you looked at actual prescribing behavior. Drug sampling does the same kind of thing. Drug sampling leads to inappropriate choice of drugs. So on your left, you see um, what was happening at this particular medical center before they banned samples. This is, for, again, talking about prescribing of antihypertensives. And for what is the, is the drug that's chosen for newly diagnosed uncomplicated hypertension in line with guidelines or not? Before they stopped taking samples, two-thirds was not in line with guidelines. After they stopped taking samples, two-thirds was in line with taking samples. Having the sample around biases what you choose for your prescribing. And it also means that you end up prescribing more expensively. So finally, do doctors choose the appropriate medication? So here we look at some data from Ontario. This is the province where I come from. Um, prescribing of antipsychotics to people who go into nursing homes. Um, and out of, this is a group of almost 20,000 people who, before they went into a nursing home, had never used an antipsychotic and had no history of any major psychosis which would justify a diagnosis or a prescription for these products. Within 100 days of entering the nursing home, 17% had got a, um, a prescription for one of these and after one year that was up to about one in four people and 10% were getting a dosage that was higher than recommended. Antibiotic prescribing to adults is also poor. So the doctors in this case were giving out antibiotics for acute bronchitis, not appropriate. Pneumonia, yes. Sinusitis, pharyngitis, not appropriate. And one quarter of the people visiting for asthma got an antibiotic, again, not appropriate. Similarly for children, prescribing for various things was again, of, at least for antibiotics, was not appropriate. And this looks at prescribing for hypertension, uncomplicated hypertension, and what happened, what drugs do <coughs> doctors, in this case in the United States, use. And this looks at before all hacked and after all hacked. And after all hacked, you did see a bump up in the prescribing of the diuretics, but that bump was a one-time thing, and diuretics are still um, not being used nearly as often as they should. That's what the guidelines basically, all of them agree that a diuretic should be the first choice for um, uncomplicated hypertension, but despite the findings of all hat, that's barely the case. So, what are my conclusions? How well do we work? How well do we do um, in terms of are we any better than Alfred E. Newman? And in my estimation, sometimes we're not. Sometimes our attitude is what me worry. We're actually not responsible enough. So thanks very much. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Bill Morris from Dominican Hospital in Santa Cruz, California. Dr. Morris received his medical degree from the University of California, San Diego in 1989, completed his internship uh, year in internal medicine at the University of Maryland in 1990. Uh, he then received his master's of public health degree with a focus on immunology and completed a general preventive medicine residency in 1992 at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in Baltimore. After spending some time abroad working with the Pan American Health Organization uh, on measles control in Jamaica, <laughs> Dr. Morris returned to the United States and finished up his internal medicine training at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center in San Jose. He then moved to Santa Cruz with his family in 2000. He practices palliative care 
medicine in both inpatient and outpatient settings in Santa Cruz, and he's the medical director of Driftwood Skilled Nursing Facility and Janus of Santa Cruz, which is a drug and alcohol treatment provider with options for medication-assisted therapies and inpatient and outpatient services. In addition to hospice and palliative care, uh, uh, Dr. Mars's clinical interests include refugee health care, methadone, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis. He's board certified in both internal medicine and palliative care, and he's on the staff at the Dominican Hospital in Santa Cruz. His, uh, the title of his presentation today is Who Has Failed Patients, Opioids, or Physicians? So Dr. Mars. Well, I have to say, I also read Mad Magazine. Uh, but now instead of going on at the end, and now I read New England General Medicine and Janet, so you can take that from me, <laughs> what it means. But um, my, my talk today, I think, I'd like to tell you two stories, since we're focusing on the responsibilities of the practitioner. The first story is really about my professional journey in coming to understand the role of opioids in my practice as a palliative care physician. And, and so this is my graduating from medical school, my, uh, my recently uh, married wife that I, I, I was looking at me with a smile, but I think at the same time is thinking, what am I getting into, is at my side. And I was ready to start off to my internship. The other story that I'm going to tell you today is about the dramatic rise in the prescription use of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain in the United States over the last two decades. Um, that ultimately, I think, has developed so many consequences that we've seen this uh, recently, this report from the White House that in 2011 that talks about responding to America's prescription drug abuse crisis. Now, this is the opium poppy. I can just sort of picture, it's a beautiful flower. I can just sort of picture, can you see the fields in Afghanistan covered with these flowers? Um, it's a beautiful flower, and it's the flower that we derive morphine from, which is the compound that's sort of the grandfather, grandmother of all opioids um, that we use today in the United States and the world. Now, I'd like to say before going on, to dispel any any misconceptions that I don't like morphine. As a palliative care physician, I really love morphine. <laughs> I mean, there, it's one of the, for me, one of the most gratifying things that I can do to care for someone that's at the end of their life, that's in severe pain, and to carefully titrate opioids and relieve that pain. I think it's an amazing thing. And I, I could say that as anyone who has experienced a broken bone, childbirth, a surgery, any serious illness, everyone will guarantee you that opioids work for acute pain. There's no doubt about that. They're valuable drugs. I would say that if I had to get rid of any drug, if I only had, I'm sure I'm hoping that in those 30 drugs that, that Joel was talking about, that all of them have at least one opioid that they are familiar with and that they can use in general practice in Canada. But we have to balance with this this maxim that we have in medicine, comfort always, we have to balance it with do no harm. Because uh, certainly we have to do both if we're going to be practicing medicine in a safe and effective way. So here I was, I finished uh, medical school, got in the car, driving to my, my internship in, in Baltimore. And, and my, when my wife was taking turns at the wheel driving, what I would do would be <laughs> drastically just, you know, almost panicking, trying to cram in as much as I could from this book in my head, the Washington Manual of Therapeutics. And actually, I still have, this is the original copy that I had when I went up to my internship. I don't know why I kept it, but I, as I was preparing for this talk, I pulled it out of this old box in the attic. And I looked up in that book what it said about opioids. And this was in 1989. And, and there really is only a few paragraphs uh, that was in the book. And I, I wrote them down. It began with the caution, opioids should be used only when other drugs or physical measures will not provide relief of pain. It also gave the reminder that, quote, morphine and hydromorphone, or Dilaudid, are usually given to terminally ill patients with chronic severe pain. A later chapter on the treatment of malignancy states, 
Opioid analgesics should be administered to the cancer patient in severe pain without undue concern for addiction. So that's sort of what I got from the Washington Manual. And that's what I used as my reference in a lot of my internship and residency. I would think, looking back, that some of the best lessons that I got were from maybe senior residents that had picked up a few pearls and said, look, this is how you do it, Bill. You know, you, this is how you manage this pain with this opioid or morphine or whatever. And, and, you know, after three years of residency, I look back and I still don't think I was very comfortable using opioids to control pain. After fitting residency, I took up a position as, as a hospitalist teaching house staff, things that I just recently learned myself. But really what it took to make me realize that I didn't know much about opioids was when my father, seen here, this is my, my father on the left, obviously, and my oldest daughter on the right, um, who now is in college, but it took him dying of lung cancer for me to really realize that I didn't know what I needed to know about managing pain with opioids. I remember sitting at the dining room table before we realized that his cancer had spread from his lung to his brain, and he was holding his head in his hands, and all we really gave him was Tylenol. And I didn't, I was here, I was just finishing my residency, and I didn't really feel that comfortable giving him morphine or knowing what to do. And this was before we'd really known that this was cancer, but still, he was in chronic bad pain. An important study that came out about that same time, the SUPPORT trial, which was the study to understand prognoses and preferences for outcomes and risk of treatment, uh, was, really showed me that I wasn't alone. This two-year prospective observational study of hospitalized patients looked at about 9,000 patients in five different teaching hospitals across the United States in a prospective manner, and, and really showed us that we really weren't taking care of our patients that were dying in these hospitals in a way that they really needed to be or wanted to be. In 50% of the conscious patients, family members perceived that they were in moderate to severe pain at the end of life. So when this study came out and other um, data started coming out about that time, it generated lots of money from foundations. Roberts Johnson and other foundations, Soros Foundations, gave a lot of money to improving how we care for patients at the end of life. And with that, really palliative care exploded as a specialty. I began to get interested in this field. You can see here in this graph the growth of inpatient palliative care programs um, supported by the funding of foundations from 2000 to 2008, and it really went up dramatically and it kept going up. We're expanding from inpatient programs now, outpatient programs are developing, hospice itself has exploded as well during that time. So these were all good things, and we had a lot of success caring for patients with opiates at the end of their life. But I think we started to look around and say, well, you know, if we're doing this good job with patients who are dying with opiates, maybe we can do just as good a job in patients that have chronic pain. Because if you look at this slide, this potential market for prescription opioids in the United States in 2011, you look at this, the bar on the left, that's the number of people that die about more or less in a year in the United States, about two million. The bar on the right is the number of patients that's estimated that have chronic pain in the United States. So anywhere from 50 to 100 million people, there's different estimates and different <coughs> reports and different ground areas that you look. But, you know, that's a huge, huge difference in market. I mean, if you were a pharmaceutical company and wanted to sell a, a opioid to someone, would you rather take the market on the left, a small, a relatively small group that don't live very long, or the market on the right that live for a long time and have pain? <clears throat> Indeed, there are a lot of characteristics of opioids that make them very favorable for non-cancer pain patients with chronic pain. Uh, as I said, it's a large potential market. They get treated for a long period of time. I mean, think about the, the uh, 30 or 20 year old with bad back that's going to live for 30, 40 more years. And if they're going to get on opioids, that's great. And then on top of that, it's difficult to discontinue these drugs, as we know, when someone has been on them for a while because of physical dependence forms. And as I talked about in a little bit, addiction also is at risk, would keep you on them for a long time as well. This last characteristic, no set upper limit dose. To me, I can't think of another drug that has this characteristic. If someone's pain is no longer controlled on a certain dose, I think that certainly pharmaceutical companies would be more than happy to produce more medication to allow that dose to be increased, and we can keep going up and up and up, and we have in many patients. So this article came out in 1986 by Portnor and Foley, and it's been 
blamed, I think, to some degree, uh, on the justification for using opioids in chronic non-cancer pain. This was a, a study of only 38 cases that were reported in the literature about partial or acceptable or fully adequate relief of pain when they were given chronic opioids. These patients were given um, moderate doses, um, and, and for the most part, they had persistent relief of their pain per this report. The problem was with this port was obviously the small number of patients, but also the retrospective design. But despite this, it had been used and has been used um, to continue to justify uh, the use of opioids in chronic non-cancer pain. With this information, pharmaceutical companies certainly jumped on the bandwagon. And this slide shows some educational materials that were funded or sponsored by pharmaceutical companies to really promote the use of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. They basically were spreading what in some ways can be considered the gospel, that opioids were safe and effective for chronic pain when used properly. And I certainly heard those words. I say gospel only partially jokingly, because in a recent article in the Wall Street Journal that explored this rapid rise of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain in the United States, they quoted a, a psychologist, Steve Passick, who had been actively involved in the initial educational efforts to promote opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. And they have him saying that the educational efforts to increase opioid acceptance were based on a, really an effort to improve, a zeal to improve patients' lives. And quote, having the makings of a religious movement. But what about safety? Reminiscent of the small Portnoy and Foley study article that was published, there was another article that's frequently mentioned this was um, on the safety of opioids for chronic pain. This was actually just a, uh, a New England Journal of Medicine letter to the editor that was published in 1980 that talked about addiction being rare. And what the, these two, author, the two authors uh, mentioned in this article, Porter and Jake, they said that they looked at about, I think it was about 11,000, 12,000 hospitalized patients who had received at least one narcotic preparation during their hospitalization. And then they looked at their files to see what happened to those patients. And they discovered only four cases of, quote, reasonably well-documented addiction in patients who had no history of addiction. This statistic was quoted in landmark 1996 consensus statement between the American Pain Society and the American Academy of Pain Medicine that said there was little risk of addiction and overdose among pain patients. And this reference, along with the Foley and, and Portnoy and Foley article, had been repeatedly referenced to say that, look, these drugs are effective and they're safe. And I was a true believer. In the late 1990s and 2000s, as a medical director of a hospice and a palliative care physician, I would go and lecture to, family, to patients, to nursing homes, to family groups, saying pain was the antidote to addiction. You know, addiction would be rare. You don't need to worry about this. Oh, you'll fall asleep way before you'll overdose. I don't remember saying that. I supported efforts to say pain was the fifth vital sign. We should do this. We need to monitor pain in the hospitals, and we need to treat, and we need to be aggressive. And I really did have the impression and, and the feeling that under treatment of pain was malpractice. And that, I mean, I remember clearly that um, some of the physicians in our community did not have a DEA license because they just didn't want to be bothered at prescribing opiates and thinking how outrageous that was. <laughs> Essentially, this was a real, I think, a well-meaning effort to say there was unneeded suffering out there and that we did not need to worry about opioids to give pain medicines to patients and control their pain. Now, I'm going I'm to skip this thing because I don't think... Well, I'll see. Do we have access to the internet? Skip it. Okay, well, please. <laughs> so, certainly pharmaceutical companies paid attention as well. So this slide compares the money that was spent, monies that were spent after the release of three different long-acting opioids. The, the gray bar are the white line, these are the very small bars to the left, is for MS Cotton. The five years after release, how much money was spent by that, that company to its marketing? The bar to the far right, the dark bar, is for fentanyl patches, dirties, and patches. The bar in the middle is for OxyContin. So OxyContin, when Purdue Frederick released it, Purdue um, Pharma, they basically spent tons of money to market it. And we still see that. I mean, in my community in Santa Cruz, for some reason, the oncologists all like to use OxyContin. And I go, and it's a, it's, it's a problem to some degree because patients, when they get to a point if they, their therapies aren't working and they go into hospice, 
we have to switch into long acting morphine or MS or extended release morphine because it's really oxycontin remains very expensive. But you know, in some ways, this was a good investment. If you were shareholders for a pharmaceutical company for Purdue, when you look at the overall market for opioids in the United States, in 2010 they peaked out at 8.4 billion dollars, and now they dropped a little bit to 8.3 in 2011. But still, that's a huge amount of money. Um, this next slide shows by individual prescriptions sold. And this is not all opioids. These are the, uh, the top five prescriptions that are prescribed in the United States. And, and it's important to realize that these are just prescriptions. So a prescription might be written with five refills. That's not taken into account here. So it's not the, the absolute number of pills prescribed, but the number of prescriptions. And the number one, as you see here, the blue line on the top, is hydrocodone, which is either Vicodin or Norco. Um, and, and this hydrocodone has been the number one prescription prescribed in the United States for years. And it's gone from 20 or maybe to 30 million more than the next closest prescription, which is levothyroxine. I think this is even more remarkable when you think about that hydrocodone is mixed with Tylenol or cinnamon. So it's limited by how much we can give. We can give probably, for Vicodin, since it has 500 milligrams of acetaminophen, you shouldn't really be taking more than 12 tablets in a day to avoid liver toxicity. So what happens when um, you have a drug that, that has a limit on how much you can prescribe? Well, that has a, 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 it has a problem with that. Well, it reminds me of something else, because what happened with, with hydrocodone is they then developed Norco, which in our area has really taken over as the new Vicodin, is Norco, because it has less acetaminophen. And that, I, I, I would think, probably really reminds me of this. You know, another <laughs> habit-forming drug. And what happens when we identify there's something bad in the substance? We just make it light. We reduce the amount of bad substance, but we still want to try to sell as much as we can. You know, and now I think the latest effort is to try to get hydrocodone without any Tylenol in it at all. I mean, one of my jobs in Santa Cruz is I work as the, the director of an ethanol clinic. And, and the word that I get from my counselors in the methanol clinic is, is that the patients that we care for that have opioid dependency addiction problems that we're managing with methadone can't wait until hydrocodone comes out uh, without any Tylenol. As a, as a physician that um, takes care of patients that are on opioids, um, it, it really concerns me, though, this hydrocodone use. When we look at the global consumption of, uh, of these two drugs, hydrocodone and oxycodone. If you look here, this, this um, pie graph to the left is the amount of hydrocodone consumed. It's made in the world, consumed by the United States. We, we use up, we consume 99% of all the hydrocodone made in the world. Uh, oxycodone, we're not as greedy for, but we still, when I mean, you think about it, the United States alone takes up all that drug in, in what we need to control our pain. Now, unfortunately, with the use of all these opioids, we started to see the problems with safety. This next slide shows the rise of opioid sales in the United States, represented by the green line, was paralleled by the rise over the last 10, 15 years with opioid deaths, in the, or opioid-related deaths in the orange line and admissions to opioid treatment programs. But to me, the, the statistic that really, I think, got my attention and probably got a lot of people's attention was when, for the first time in 2008, the deaths related to drug poisoning and overdose surpassed, in young adults, the deaths related to motor vehicle accidents. We were doing a great job of bringing down motor vehicle accidents at the same time we were increasing the amount of deaths that occurred with uh, opioid and overdose toxicities. Now, as an individual practitioner taking care of patients, I was well aware of all the side effects and adverse effects of opioids. And you can see them listed up there. Uh, really, the only one that I really focused on in my days of preaching the gospel of opioids was constipation, because patients really saw that. But all these other symptoms are here, and I think we're starting to get an appreciation of the possibility that giving opioids, and I'm not going to talk much about this, but opioids maybe produce pain or hyperalgesia, and that's starting to get more and more press. Debatable people, it's very controversial and there's a lot of debate about it, but I think it does, I see it happen. We see some of these others, decreased immune system, it's unclear about the significance of that, but there is some data that suggests that people in nursing homes and opioids have a higher incidence of pneumonia, perhaps aspiration, but it may be related to immune deficiencies, disruption of sleep and sleep apnea, 
decreased testosterone, um, nausea, vomiting, hypertension, things that we've always been aware of. But we're starting to, I think, appreciate that a lot of the adverse personal, the, you know, individual adverse side effects are significant. But I think what's caught the attention of, of the White House and, and powers that be are the, these other adverse effects of addiction, aberrant related behaviors. And there's a lot of debate. It's hard to get a clear, I think, handle on how much is addiction, how much is what we call opioid aberrant related behaviors. My own reading of the literature and my own impression in my clinical experience is that a lot of what we call maybe addiction is more aberrant behaviors, trying to get a prescription filled early, selling your prescriptions, you know, things that maybe aren't addiction, but they're not something we want to encourage or promote. Um, I think if we look at that, it's probably about 30 to 40 percent in the literature, but there's definitions that vary, so it's very vague. And then addiction might be 5%, and I'm sort of an optimistic. Other people might say 30% addiction is the problem, but I think addiction, when someone clearly has lost control of the opioids, they're continuing to use it despite harm, I see that in only about 5 or maybe at the 5 to 7% of the patients that I see. But still, 30, maybe 30, 40%, with 2 to 5%, combine those two bad behaviors, bad outcomes, certainly a big problem that we're taking more attention to. The other issue that's come up is there's more diversion. I want everyone here who's gotten a prescription for Vicodin or Norco from dentists, who are the, probably the biggest prescribers, or any doctor or any opioid to raise their hand. Raise your hand if you've gotten a prescription in the last six months. All right, now, put your hand down if as soon as you were done with the opioids, you threw them away. No, I, I mean, I have opioids in my, and I have no problem in my medicine cabinet. I'm thinking if I go hiking, backpacking, I want to take some life, and if I break an ankle, something happened, I want to have it. I don't get rid of it myself, and I'm sensitized to this. But that's a big problem. And we see this that in the, in the National Prescription on Health and, and uh, Drug Use in 2010. Most people who get illicit drugs that weren't prescribed to them get it from a friend or family member for free. They just, they have it available because there's a lot of opioids out there. So this caught up with Purdue eventually. In 2007, Purdue agreed to pay over $600 million in a fine um, for promoting that OxyContin was safer and less likely to lead to addiction than other opioids. And it was described in the document that it extensive long-term conspiracy with the goal to generate maximum amount of revenue possible was the approach that Purdue had, had taken. But in, in retrospect, why would we think, now, here's heroin on the right. The drug that my patients have problems with in the methanol time. Here's oxycodone on the left. Why would we think that they would have any different effects? When you look at this, look at, I mean, they're, if you look at them, they're almost exactly the same except for a few extra targets on the end. Why would we expect them to be any different? I mean, I think deep down, we knew that opioids were always dangerous. Why else would there have been so much insistence on their safety and efforts to try to educate around that? For me, what was not clear was their effectiveness at treating chronic non-cancer pain. What does the data show about that? I was willing to forgive a world of harm if they would relieve suffering from the tens of millions of people that really were struggling with pain in the United States. So what are the therapy, what do the data show? Well, I think there's certain uh, sort of common themes in the data. First is that, and, and this is from a, a, pre, a, a conference that I went to, the group health put on in Seattle, Washington about opioid safety. And it really points out that if you look at these other common conditions like high blood pressure or hyperlipidemia, that uh, compared with opioids, studies for opioids for chronic pain, that many, many more people have been studied for those other conditions that are just as common than prescriptions for uh, opioids. And in fact, there was a statement in the Journal American Medical Association recently um, that talked about um, the recent increase in the rate of opioid prescriptions for chronic non-cancer pain has not seen a parallel growth from the evidence base. When we look at data from group health, there really is, I think, some interesting conclusions that can be drawn. They took, they took their patients in the Pacific Northwest and divided them into, that are on chronic opioids for pain, and divided them into low dose, medium dose, and high dose groups. And, and what strikes me about this slide is that, you know, when we, in palliative care, we try to get people's pain down to a score of three on a scale of one to ten, zero to ten or less. In patients that are on the high dose of opioids, um, greater than 120 milligrams of morphine equivalent orally per day, that, look at that, about 40 percent were in severe pain, only seven percent had that reached that target of pain control with three or less. And interestingly, as you went up on the opioid dose, it was less likely to have good control of pain. 
Similarly, as you went up on the opioid dose, you were more likely to have more days of activity limitation due to your pain. And thirdly, you are, it doesn't surprise you, um, I'm sure, that the more dose of opioid you took, the more likely you were to be depressed. In a recent review in the Journal of the American Medical Association, on the, um, uh, it was actually reporting on the Cochrane review of, of rheumatoid arthritis pain, opioids and rheumatoid arthritis pain. They found that only 11 randomized controlled trials were really eligible for their review, and, and none were felt to have a low risk of bias. Four studies went less than one week. The longest was for six weeks, for only a total of 672 patients. And in this table that looks at a summary of the data, really what it showed was that although there was some efficacy, when you, tried, when you also included in that safety, so they looked at patients with a special statistic called a near statistic, where they looked at patients who both had at least a 30% reduction in pain and did not have adverse, patients that had both those outcomes. They found that there was no more likely to have uh, to meet criteria for success with opioids than with placebo. So in summary, I would say, I'm sorry this didn't turn out with the, the yellow, but what I tried to do here was highlight some of the reviews that I've looked at that were observational and randomized controlled trials, and then in the blue were the epidemiologic data. But the data, I think, in general shows that perhaps opioids have a modest, maybe mild to moderate efficacy for chronic cancer pain, or for chronic non-cancer pain. Usually with the lower doses, and when you get to the higher doses, you're not as successful. The duration in a lot of the observational and randomized control trials were short, um, usually less than four months for randomized controlled trials. And to me, what strikes stands out is that 68% of patients in these trials tend to drop out. Most of them drop out for adverse effects, but a significant percent, about 20%, drop out for no improvement in their pain over time. When we look at bigger data sets, the epidemiologic data, you would assume that in countries that had a more liberal prescribing policy, like Denmark, if opioids were working, we should see a decreased prevalence in pain, and that is not the case. Function appears to be worse when we look at bigger populations, and the other thing that's scary is that when we look at these bigger data sets, epidemiologic data sets, and there's some good data out of Canada um, and other places that look at things like motor vehicle accidents and overdoses, <coughs> And it seems that the safety issues come to the forefront when we see bigger numbers. Now, I mean, in general, if you think about it, it turns out that to be pain-free is not a good thing. And this really, I just wanted to show this slide. This was an article, for those that you read in the New York Times a, a few months back, where it looks at people who are born without pain. And those people have a horrible life. And a lot of them don't make it to adulthood. Um, it's an interesting article, I encourage you to read it, because it gives some perspective as if our goal is to make someone pain-free, it may be not be a good thing because pain is a good warning system. We've evolved to have pain systems in our body to help us survive. So what happened now recently in my practice is I'm starting to see patients who are told, who come to me and uh, doctors send them to me and say, hey, Bill, you know, will you see this patient? I don't think they're dying, that's what they always say because I'm palliative care, um, but, but um, they're on these high doses of opioids and they don't, their pain is in control, can you see them? So I'm starting to devise in my mind, I mean I, I would propose that we need to start to think about this concept of opioid failure. And, and I would propose that we define opioid failure as someone that has chronic non-cancer, non-terminal pain, who's taking greater than 120 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent per day. Why 120? Well, it's around the range that's been worked out in the Pacific Northwest, the group health and other experts who have proposed that that's where we start to see a, a rapid rise in adverse events, overdoses and other problems. And in fact, in Washington state, if you're on workman's comp and you're over 110 milligrams of or oral morphine equivalent per day, you have to go see a pain expert. And the pain scores consistently have to be greater than five out of 10, meaning they're not controlled. And you have to give them at least three months duration on the opioids to titrate up to see if they can be controlled. Why do we do this? Well, I think we need to define opioid failure because once we define it as an entity, it's not something you can search on, uh, you know, PubMed and find answer, you know, find information about. It. But if we start to define it as an entity, we can start to ask questions. How do we deal with it? How do we recognize it? What are the best treatments for it when we see it? How do we deal with these patients? In closing, I would like to say that. The responsibilities for healthcare providers regarding opioids for chronic pain, I think, should be fourfold. One is we certainly have to prevent adverse events. We have to carefully select our patients that we're putting on opioids for chronic non-cancer pain and monitor them on therapy. 
There's been some good work around the risk mitigation strategies that the federal government made pharmaceutical companies come up with. But I would caution us that we can't stop there. To stop there, essentially to say, okay, we're going to exclude patients that we, we think are bad risks for opioids, and we're going to monitor for the bad apples that pop up when, we get, when they get through the gatekeepers. What does that imply? Well, I think that implies that opioids, that patients have failed the opioids. The patients are the bad guys. And it reminds me of some of the risk mitigation or the harm reduction models that we've seen in the alcohol industry or the tobacco industry. Does that do a lot in the long run? I, I'm not saying they're bad, but I think we need to do more than that. I think we really have to, I think, come to the conclusion that, you know, most of the time, opioids fail, not patients, when someone fails. Secondly, I think we have to educate. I think we have to educate both patients and clinicians. We have to use valid, relevant data. We can't depend on small letters to the editor, small reports. We really have to get good data, and we have to do more research to look at, it. is this something that works? I mean, maybe there's a small subset of patients with chronic pain that opioids will work for, and we need to identify those. I think a good source for this education is Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. And I put their website up there. They're, they're, they don't get any money from pharmaceutical company or the industry, and they actually are uh, real leaders in this field of education and, uh, and awareness for patients and, and um, clinicians. I think Group Health in the Pacific Northwest is another good resource. They've done a lot of work, and you can go online and get transcripts from their uh, Opioid Safety Summit that was done last fall. And I think the CDC is a good resource as well. Since the White House report, they've had a lot of good initiatives for um, developing opioid safety and strategies. But I think despite this, we have to get better at identifying opioid failure. We have to um, offer alternatives to people whose opioids have failed. We need to be able to say to them, um, not judge them with um, condemnation, you're an addict, you know, give them shame. We need to say, here, we've gotten into this problem, we need to work together, not abandon them, and we need to say, we need to get you out of this problem. We need to graduate, and in my experience, when I explain it to patients, the vast majority of them say, okay, they're scared, they don't want to get up their opioids, um, but they're willing to try as long as I don't abandon them. When we gradually come down, and we have varying success, and that's, I think we need to learn more about, it. is it possible? There's some out there that would say it's not possible. That if you've been on a high dose of opioids for long periods, we can't get you off. And we should just sort of medicate those people and monitor to reduce harm. And I think lastly what we need to do, and this certainly isn't least, is we need to develop and promote alternative effective treatments for chronic pain. In, in my community, we're starting to try to develop a concept of an opioid assessment clinic, and patients, a doctor says, oh, that's great, Bill. I'm glad you're doing a pain clinic. And I say, it's not a pain clinic. This is an opioid assessment clinic. We still need to focus on how do we manage these patients with chronic pain? What do we do for that? And I think that it's certainly worth investment. Chronic pain is thought to drain about 85 to 95, I think, what is it, million or billion dollars? I have to look at my paper. A year, not 85 to 90 billion a year on the economy with chronic pain, due to chronic pain. So it's certainly worth the investment. And I think that we can't risk worrying about um, harming um, without continuing to focus on comfort always. Thank you very much. Quick question in the On the prescription of uh, opioids, I'm in South Carolina where we just had an opioid problem. <coughs> uh, while the REMS are a great idea, the current structure of REMS are driven by the pharmaceutical industry, the way the FDA had, has organized it. So the goal is that the REMS that are going to be developed are under the guidelines the way the pharmaceutical industry tells us to develop them. And uh, I think at the end of the day, if we're trying to do this conference about pharmaceutical conflict of interest, seems to me to establish rent is one of the most important things we've all agreed to. Let the pharmaceutical industry drive the construct and goal and how those things are structured is, to, is off, off point. And secondly, as you talk about all your good work with opioids, I understand all that. In South Carolina, as I mentioned to you last night, all there, but we have lots of geography. We have lots of doctors we need to educate. Many of these doctors we can educate and license them. If, if we can uh, acquire the licensing you basically like opioids, maybe that will help. But the largest prescriber of opioids, as I mentioned, I fear for my life that we go in and try to educate them, because they may not be prescribing opioids because they're not educated. They may be part of the medical economy. And when we looked at the prescription monitoring program database, it seemed clear to me that some of the doctor shopping and doctor mills that we had in South Carolina, 
kind of guy that I would invite to my house for a birthday party, you know, where I tried to educate you. I don't know, I think those are big problems. I mean, I, you know, the vast majority, I think, of patients who have adverse events on morphine um, or opioids aren't um, misusing them. I mean, they're mixing them with a little alcohol or maybe a benzodiazepine, and they have an adverse outcome. Right? And I think that, um, you know, the doctor uh, pill mills, I think, are a huge problem. And I don't know what the answer is to that. But I do think that if we just allow REMS to be the answer, we sort of, we sort of palliated ourselves. I'm just aware of the REMS we use that a lot, where the drug company organized, identified, funded REMS. So right. the way I probably wouldn't even have a single REM in place, because I'm not anxious to work with a drug company. Yeah. I mean, I think the bigger question is, have, do, have opioids failed for chronic pain? And, and, it were, and I think the answer is probably yes. You know, there may be a subset of patients that do respond and are helped, but, um, and I think we need more data about that. But I think that um, it's, sort of, it's sort of distracting us. It's sort of like, well, if we avoid um, marketing alcohol to young kids, we're fine. We don't have any problem with alcohol anymore. If we reduce the tar in cigarettes, we're fine. We don't have any problem anymore. I think it's sort of distracting us from the bigger issue. Um, but it is, it's not going to be an easy problem in education. I know in California, we had to educate, we had to, for a while there, had to take education on using opiates and, and pain relief to get our license renewed. Um, and that was the strategy that was used. Maybe we need to um, have a strategy to say you have to take education about opiates and um, how they don't should be used before you get your license. My question uh, is for Dr. Morris. Uh, I wanted to thank you for reframing. Can you please identify yourself? Uh, Marianne Rothschild. I'm a family practice doctor in Maryland. And I see people who come in on these opiates and I see people with chronic pain, among other people. Um, and the reframe of opiate failure was so helpful for me because uh, rather than seeing it as not enough, seeing it as the inappropriate solution. So what I wanted to ask you is, you mentioned effective alternative treatments, and since you're in that ballgame, as I am, what have you found are effective alternative treatments for chronic kind of pain? Well, I tell you, patients that I've, I've, I've had the conversation with about getting off of opioids, and they're open to it, which actually surprises me. I mean, I'm very um, impressed by my patients that say, you know, I, this is scary, but I want to try to get off opioids. And as I taper down, what I found, and I think there's literature that's data that's coming out in the literature about this, is that pain does not seem to get worse. I mean, if your pain scores are eight to nine, um, and you're on, you know, 200 milligrams of morphine a day, um, and you come down, how much worse can they get? Um, but patients tend to tell me the pain is no worse, and what we see is function improves. And so um, I can tell them that that's a, a pretty hopeful outcome if we get you off the opioids, and we have conversations around that pain is maybe not going to go away. But um, one of the, I find I found interesting that um, tramadol or Ultram is helpful. Um, we try other alternatives like you know Neurontin. Um, gabapentin, we do Lyrica, we do Cymbalta, other drugs that work in a different way than the opioid pathways. And it seems to help them do it. And because their pain is already high, they're sort of like, well, I'm not any worse, but now I'm getting up. Instead of lying on the couch all day, I'm interacting with my family, I'm taking my kid to school, I'm not falling asleep. One wife told me that you know, her husband was, was like nodding off uh, at the computer and hitting his head on the computer. And, um, and now he doesn't do that anymore. Um, and his pain is the same. So, I mean, it's not, I haven't solved the problem of this pain. But I do think that that's another issue. And in our community, we're saying, well, this is, this is an issue, opioid use, uh, using a, a use of a drug that is um, not working and stopping that is one issue. The other issue needs to be, okay, how do we manage chronic pain? And that's, in some ways, it's, it's connected, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, patients, when I, when I call the doctor and say, I think we should take your patient on opioids, the doctor will say, but they have pain. And I go, I know, and we need to deal with that. Let's work on how we can do that in a different way. Uh, interventionalists, sometimes um, patients will get relief from neurostimulators and other things for back pain, but it is, it continues to be a big problem that we need to focus on and not be distracted from, you know, the issue of continuing to give opioids. Okay, uh, Kevin Cavanaugh from uh, Kentucky. I had one, one comment, one question. Uh, you had mentioned about uh, uh, people keeping the uh, products in their home after they've used them. But one of the problems is there's really not a proper way of disposing them. You're not supposed to put in your water mechanism or water system. And there's, uh, 
no place to deliver them to. I think our sheriff in, our, in Fayette County twice a year uh, runs a program we convert them in. But, you know, that's something really that pharmacists a pharmacy should be doing. If you prescribe them, you should have a way to bring back in and use pills and dispose of them. Uh, the, the other, uh, which is more of a question, is what effect do you think that Medicare's uh, patient surveys, which hospital finances are, are, have been tied to, that uh, look at how well pain is controlled is, is leading to maybe overutilization of narcotics in, in our region? And, uh, Kentucky, I think about a third of the patients are probably on opioids to begin with, or at least an antipsychotic medication. So you're saying that the drive for patient satisfaction? That's correct. Well, you're, you're financially linked to right. it. It's not the drive for patient satisfaction. It's an aggregate, you know, just be drive for reimbursement or money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think part of it is how we approach uh, the problem of opioid failure and how we approach our patients. I mean, if we approach it, you know, if you scumball addict, get out of my practice, they're not going to be very satisfied. But if you approach it that, you know, I think we've developed, and we've caused a problem, we need to deal with it now, we're going to deal with it, we're not going to abandon you. Um, if you really feel, and if, after assessment, and some patients I think that 5%, maybe 7% that really are addicted are going to need some specialty care in addiction medicine. But I think a large percentage of people are just continuing to take it because they've been prescribed it and they don't know what else to do. And, and when we say to them, well, I think there's a problem, I mean, my patients, some of my most dedicated patients are the ones that I presented this problem to. Together we've gotten them down, off or down on their opioid dose. And they're very happy because um, they were always worried that someone was going to cut them off or someone was going to call them an addict. So in some ways, they're my most loyal patients if we approach it in a way that is, you know, we're going to take care of you. Um, with regard to the pharmacy comment, I do think we, you know, what, one of the things, if you're going to tackle this in a community, you need to involve pharmacies, not only to dispose of the drugs, but also to monitor drugs. I mean, you go to your pharmacist, they know who's using all these opioids. Um, much more than the doctors do. And they have these patients coming in from different doctors filling the, um, opioids in their, in their pharmacies. So I think it's important that any um, systematic uh, community-wide plan includes pharmacy uh, leaders. Bill, if I could just comment on uh, the other question you had about since hospitals are currently in the future will get some of their Medicare payments determined by patient satisfaction scores. This is definitely one of the questions on there. Is how easily uh, completely was your pain relieved? There's questions about were you in a quiet environment? Did people respond quickly to the call light and that sort of thing? And I think it's a uh, pretty fair statement that a lot of emergency rooms are quick to, a lot of emergency rooms are quick to you know, whip out the dilaudid as soon as people come waltzing through the door complaining of abdominal pain or severe headache. Uh, I was always trained to not mask the patient's pain when you didn't have a diagnosis established yet. But I think this has sort of almost become a de rigueur, you know, to just start giving them you know, cheesy as soon as they come to the door. My name's uh, Mike Allen from Dalhousie University in Halifax. I have a comment for Dr. Lawrence and a question for anybody. Um, I really appreciated your review of the evidence about the opioids, but I think another aspect of that is that most of the studies are against placebo. And there aren't very many studies against other medications, and when you look at those, the benefits of opioids in pain control are marginal, and there's no evidence.